when, when the British came to India, they brought this idea with them that Logos is superior to Mythos. It was very interesting because it reminded me really of the myths. I said, oh, this is such a Greek way of writing. Because the Greek story structure revolves around chaos and order. For me, the cave with its shadows is chaos, ignorance, the absence of reason. Because you're subjected to the mythos of other people. Until you leave the cave and come into the sunlight, out of the shadows towards knowledge. There is a linearity in the narrative. From to. Teleological. Which is how we think today, right? We are a developing society. We have to go from there to here. Look at the way we talk about tribal cultures. They are primitive and we are civilized. We are in the sunlight, they are in the shadows. We have to go and bring them out to the sunlight. Chaos to order, linearity. And this sort of, I have never seen anything like this in Indian philosophy, in Indian mythology. Although people keep saying that, you know, there are Indian hymns which talk about take me from darkness to light. What they forget is, after the light comes the darkness again. And then again, and again, because the wise man knows what you consider sunlight is actually another part of the cave. And what I think is sunlight is probably another part of the cave. And maybe the cave is a labyrinth that can never leave. And we keep imagining that my portion of the cave is sunlight. And we have vast symposium and arguments that my part of the cave is sunlight and your part is wrong. And that's a debate. Until we realize that maybe there is no sun. Maybe the sun is inside us, awaiting discovery while we are searching outside. And this is the way the Indian storytellers would talk about the cave. The gods who sit inside the cave, the wise man who goes into the cave, he's inside the labyrinth. That is where wisdom resides, not outside. A very different way of looking. Next slide, please. So we begin with the old gods. That's Cronus eating his own son, Saturday eating the weak, time, the old gods. And the one thing in Greek mythology is of old gods, the titans, who eat and consume the Olympians. Next slide, please. And the new god, the Olympians, who overpower the old gods, the titans. This is Zeus, not quite the way the Greeks would imagine it. I have imagined it as a Hindu god, <laughs> symmetrical with gestures to suggest, this gesture is called Vayada Mudra, I give you whatever you want. And the, it's a very Bharatnatyam dance, suppose, holding the thunderbolt. And the new gods defeat the old gods and are uncomfortable with the future gods, humans, terrified of humans, that the humans will one day take over the way they took over from the old gods. This structure, is something that I was unfamiliar with. Early translations of when the Hindu um, mythologies were translated, people started, there, there's a conflict between two sets of gods, the Devas and the Asuras. And the early translators said, well, Devas are gods, obviously, but the, who are the Asuras? Are they the old gods? Are they titans? And that structure didn't work. It just didn't work because this is a linear structure. Old gods go away and new gods keep coming. The old generation tries to eat the next generation, but the next generation triumphs over the older generation. In fact, the Oedipus complex that we talk about is about the triumph of the younger generation over the older generation. Indian philosophy works completely the other way. The older generation always prevails on the younger generation. It's called the Yayati complex. Next slide, please. And so the old gods are punished. This is Atlas, punished 
And this is where the idea of gods who punish and the Greek structure, this is how the gods, if you anger the Olympians, they will punish you. The idea of the angry god who controls, and remember Zeus influenced the Christian traditions much later. The idea of an angry god who can punish you, not quite fitting in the Puranic structures. It just doesn't work. And people try to force fit these myths. They don't work. The idea of a god who judges doesn't exist in Hindu mythology. There is no concept of judgment day. There is no punishment given by an external authority. Your own life creates circumstances which are your punishment. Because the Indians believed in rebirth and they believed in karma. Your actions create reactions which are your punishment. You don't need a judge, a lawyer, a prosecutor to decide your fate. You are determining your fate as you live. Very different way of looking. So there's no concept of judgment day. There isn't one. There's no... So whenever there is this stories and pictures of apocalypse, the words used in India, when it's translated in India, they use Urdu words. Kayamat. That's an Urdu word. Which Indians are, all Indians are familiar with the Urdu word. They come from, these words have origins in Persia. They didn't originate in India because there is no equivalent trans. This pralai, pralai is doomsday, but doomsday is just before the rebirth. There is no doomsday as the end. There is no full stop. Death is not a full stop. The world doesn't have a full stop. It's only commas and semicolons. We have yet to discover the full stop. So stories have no beginning. Stories have no end. There are no old gods. There are no new gods. There is no from and to. It is from, to, to, from. Which is why in Hindi, the word for yesterday and tomorrow are exactly the same. Kal, kal. So yesterday is the same as tomorrow. Because everything repeats itself. The old gods will come back. And the new gods will be defeated. But nothing lasts forever, as the Buddha said. And the Hindu gods agree. Next slide, please. But of course, we need special human beings. And this is Dane being seduced by Zeus, Sedu seduction is a nice word. I don't think a consent was asked. The gods take what they want. And that is how extraordinary humans are created. So extraordinariness means you have a part of the Olympian inside you. Your mother or your father was enchanted, seduced or raped by a god. And therefore you become special. When the Romans became an empire and Virgil wanted to write the Aeneid, he, he was, it was very important for him to trace legacy to the gods, to Aeneas, who is the child of Aphrodite. So there's always the intervention of the gods to create extraordinary beings. Heroes are not heroes simply because they worked hard to be great. They have a divine spark in them. They are special from the day they are born. Hero as a concept does not exist in Hindu mythology. The hero's journey, Joseph Campbell wrote a very famous thing which controls Hollywood today. It's called the monomyth of a hero who goes through a journey. I consult a lot of television channels on Indian epics and they keep saying, sir, we need catharsis because they're using Aristotle structures. I said, what is the catharsis of Ram? And I'm like, no, there isn't one. And they find it very disturbing because they're trained to create heroes who have a journey. But the structure in Hindu stories is of the wise one who knows everything and everybody else who knows something. And it is not about a journey from point A to point B. It is not about killing the old gods. It is not about the triumph of the new gods. It is about discovering the way the world is and not the way you would like the world to be. Next slide, please. And of course, the most terrifying thing in Greek mythology comes from India. Dionysus. Bacchus. Where does he come from? He is the son of God, feared, who 
who goes on a trip of madness for, to India and comes back from India. He brings wine and dance and song. He brings ecstasy, not the drug. <laughs> Probably the drug too, probably the drug too. The magic, the madness, the inspiration, who shakes up the system. Apollo means order, Apollo brings order. And Bacchus comes and shakes the order, the predictability, the certainty. Drives women crazy, the Maynards eat those who oppose them. This is the Maynards attacking and killing. Passion, feared by the man who loves the head the passionate being. And many people have equated Apollo with Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva is associated with Dionysus because the madness, the, the, the mystical being who shakes things up. When I was making the slide, and I was talking to somebody, they said, oh, this sounds like Donald Trump. <laughs> Shaking up the system. Suddenly the order has been destroyed. And you're like, could it be? And there was this long conversation in the cafeteria outside. No, 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 I don't agree. I said, are you thinking he's Apollo? <laughs> you have only two choices. And that's where the, the magic happened because we are designed to look at the world in terms of good and bad. But when you start looking at the world as order which becomes stifling and chaos which breaks the stifling order and demands a shifting of pattern, you need the other. You need the one you can't stand and you worship him because that's, that's the Indian way. He who argues, he who challenges, who who breaks the system. Next slide, please. And of course, tragedy. The Greek heroes always are tragic. They achieve great things, they achieve great things only to discover finiteness and the limitations of their knowledge to discover that the horror of your city is caused by your actions. You killed your father. You made your mother your wife. <coughs> Indian narratives are not supposed to end in tragedy. The plays are written, there's always Sukhant, happy ending. Not necessarily happy ending as in ha ha ha, but you have to leave with a sense of optimism. The only two things, it's very interesting, the great epics of India, the Ramayana and Mahabharata, however, do not have happy endings. They both end in tragedy. And some people say it's the Greek influence. It's Alexander's influence on Indian epics. You can debate about it forever or listen to the different points of view. Next, please. And then, of course, stories of triumph, linearity. There is the Trojan horse. One reason it became very popular, this image, and when I was, we were selecting images for the cover, we decided this because, because many Indians are software engineers. Everybody knows the Trojan virus. <laughs> and because they know the Trojan virus, I'm <laughs> like, okay, this will sell. <laughs> because which Greek myth would connect most easily? And I said, this, this probably would, and the, uh, you know, the publishers agreed. And the whole idea, and this is the first time that Europe comes to confrontation with Asia. And this war has been going on. The Greeks attacked Troy. Alexander attacks Persia. The Romans fought the Parthians. The Holy Roman Empire went on crusades. The British Empire fought the Ottomans. And today, there is still the war on terrorism. It has been happening again and again and again and again. That's the Indian way of seeing. There is no from and to. It is from and to and to and from. It is repeating itself. Asia means the other show. It just means the other show, the other. A confrontation through strength. And the Romans, the, Roman, the Greeks loved Odysseus. The Romans didn't like him because he was cunning and he used trickery. The Romans loved valor and honor. So there were lots of schools of thought within the European civilizations. Next slide, please. And of course, love. I love this picture. It's, it's from the Odessi, when Penelope and Odysseus meet. And she's not very sure it's the same man who left 20 years ago. And she asks, says, let's get the bed out into the courtyard. 
And he says, but you can't move the bed out of the courtyard because it was built from the, the trunk of a tree whose roots have sunk in deep. You can't move it. And she smiles because only her husband knows this story. And I like this because it's exactly similar stories told in the Ramayana where, where the character Sita meets a messenger, Hanuman, and Hanuman says, come from your husband, and she's not sure. And she says, um, no, sorry, the Hanuman tells her that how will I prove to your husband that I met you? And she says, I will tell you a story that is a secret between husband and wife, exactly like Penelope's secret. And she tells the story of how a crow had once attacked her in the privacy of the bedroom and how her husband had rescued her. And that story is known only to them. And said, if you go and tell my husband this, you'll know you've met me because nobody else knows the story. Similarity or just love everywhere. Secrets between husband and wife that shall not be shared even with children. Next slide, please. And then of us going home. My story has a meta-narrative of Alexander telling the stories of Greek myths to a Hindu yogi. And I, I did this image only to show the, what happens when two cultures come together. Look at the sail, and there is a mark on the sail. There is the Indian pot, and there is the Greek amphora. One filled with wine, the other with water and fruits and flowers. And this is what Alexander takes home with him. Ideas from India along with its riches. And a sense that you can never conquer the whole world because the world is infinite. For the Greeks thought that the world is from chaos to order. Indians looked at the world as attempts of the finite human trying to conquer the infinite universe. That was the conflict. Next slide, please. And I'd like to end this conversation with the fundamental idea which separates Indian thought with Greek thought. This is the river Styx, the Skyron asking for a coin. He's going to ask us a coin when we die. And the Greeks believed that when you cross this river, you will be judged. But not one, but three judges. Remember, this is before the Christian era. They needed three judges. Now we need only one. Of course, all three were men. Some things don't change. And three men will decide whether you will go. If you have angered the gods, you'll go to Tartarus which eventually becomes hell. If you are spectacular and special and great, you shall go to the Elysium field, which the French call Champs-Élysées. <laughs> and for ordinary mediocre people who is not born of the gods, the asphodel fields. Hindus also have a river. It's called the Vaitarani. But the difference is there is no judge. There is an account man. There is an accountant at the end of it. He checks the actions you have done, and decides on your debt and equity. He keeps a record which determines that how, so it's not a one-way journey across the Vaitarani. You will come back to repay your debt. And you'll go back with more debts, and you'll come back to repay your debts, again go back with more debts, and it'll go on and on and on and on forever. Because you don't live once, and you don't die once. You live infinite lives, you experience infinite debts, and you're always in debt until the sage comes along and tells you how, one, how you can relieve yourself from all burdens and debts and liberate yourself. And when you liberate yourself, are you the selfish one who just runs away or the empathetic one who comes back to contribute to the world where people are suffering and are in debt? You see, the Greeks gave us the concept of the superhero. The limited man who becomes unlimited, or the ordinary man who becomes extraordinary. Indians gave the concept of avatar, which is not quite what James Cameron shows. <laughs> James Cameron is telling you a Greek story of an ordinary man becoming extraordinary. Avatar is the very opposite. The infinite divine becoming a finite human being for the benefit of humanity. It is what parents do to their child when you have to feed the child and you have to talk baby talk. Kuchi kuchi ku. You, from your high horse, no matter how powerful you are, the baby doesn't understand. You have to talk, do baby talk with the baby. That descent from infinity to finiteness is avatarana, coming down. That is the avatar, not quite the superhero, which Hollywood has still not understood. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dev. That, um, and I'll open with a question, and then we'll open it to you for questions. Um, one of the things I was thinking about, I was on Crete this summer, and, and you may know that one of the things that happened on Crete, there was the Minoan society, it's much older yes. than the, what is really coming out of the Mycenaean world in Greece. And the Minoan society was very peaceful, it was matriarchal, um, much more in the sensory realm, and the images are more abstract and more like the image you made of the Trojan horse. Um, so where there's less perspective, you don't see musculature, they actually look very similar to the two, to the Indian god that you showed. And I was thinking about, um, and everything was very collective. Yes. And I was thinking about this shift in perspective um, from that mm -hmm. to um, the Mycenaean and then classical Greek art with the musculature and, and, and also, we can also see in the shift from Egyptian art to Greek art, what the Greeks took from the Egyptians, yes. where you have a very static form yes. versus somebody facing you, possibly with a weapon. Um, and thinking about this, this further and further shift towards the individual and the individuality of the human form. And so I was wondering if, if um, you could speak to a difference between maybe a more collective version of, of um, about how we see yeah. uh, the art or the mythology represented versus an individual version? Uh, so one has to look, um, you know, if you look at broadly and one has to sort of place the context. Um, you see in European uh, history over 2000, uh, over 4,000 years, a movement from the goddess. So there was the world of the goddess where the goddess was powerful. Unfortunately, we don't have written material. We have um, artifacts and we have suggestions of stories um, of what happens. And because you, from the, the world of the mother goddess, you suddenly have the story of many gods, many male gods. So the polytheistic world emerges. And so one of the uh, theories about uh, Zeus going after the nymphs and the goddesses is the taming of the mother goddess. And therefore you go from mother goddess to many gods. Then it moves to the world of one god. And the one god idea really comes from Egypt and Persia. These are the places from where these ideas come. Because the pharaoh was all powerful, the Persian emperor was all powerful. They believed, uh, in fact Zoroastrianism introduces the idea of one god very strongly. Um, so you have movement from the mother goddess to many gods to one god to no god which is secularism, where I am God, I can say whatever I want. So individualism starts appearing, but it forgets that if I am God, so are you, you know? I'm like, oh, I'm God, I'm individual, and therefore the collective is forgotten, and that's where the tension starts, right? Because individualism becomes isolationism. That's not the way it, democracy was designed, but somewhere along the line, individualism becomes isolationism and insularism. But then the goddess comes back with a vengeance. And that's good, we need her. <laughs> and that's yeah, what you see today, right now. So the Maynards are back, mm. and uh, the passion is back. And I think that's where the world is going through its churn from, because we have had the world without, and you know, the one god is becoming difficult to handle. No god is very nihilistic, and there's no hope. So where do we go? We go back to the womb of the goddess, we go back to the cave. Fabulous. Okay, I could ask many more questions, but let's open it up. Um, do we need to pass this mic around? Is there? No, I don't think so. No? Okay. Um, I'm curious about the tension between monotheism and polytheism, between the idea of one and the idea of shunyata. Okay. Um, I can repeat uh, what I understood by your yes. question. Um, the tension between monotheism and polytheism, between the idea of many gods and the idea of shunyata. The idea of one versus zero. Zero. So, um, uh, so in, 
you see, it's very interesting. Um, Buddhist philosophy increasingly went towards zero. So shunya as an idea is very powerful in the later Buddhist thought. So it becomes highly nihilistic. Nothing matters in the world, zero. And then you have this tension because people are saying, no, no, that's not quite correct. So there's a lot of writings on shunya on one side. And then you have the opposing thought that everything matters. So the Hindu gods are called ananta, infinity. So zero and infinity. And in between, but at any one time, I can have relationship only with one deity. And therefore, you always deal with one deity at a time. One at a time. So you have one, so you have no God. So the hermit doesn't need gods. The world is composed of many gods. But you can deal with them one at a time. And therefore, the Indian, if you go to a puja, any traditional Indian homes, there are many, many gods. So personal god, family god, household gods, the daughter-in-law's god, the son-in-law's god, everybody god. So you have, in India, it's not surprising, you'll have Shiva, Vishnu, Jesus Christ, Makkha, Guru Nanak, Dev, everything. Because you want to hedge your bets. <laughs> You have debts to repay, you have to hedge your bets. <laughs> and therefore, it, the idea of polytheism and monotheism is not a problem in India. It's like the Indian head shake, right? Do you believe in many gods? Yes. Do you believe in one god? Yes. Do you believe in no god? Yes. So it, it's a mixture of it because divinity sees as infinity. And infinity controls, contains many singular things. And also contains zero. And zero also contains infinity. And therefore, the ideas are very fluid. It's not rigid in the sense of, if you say, um, you talk to someone, they'll say, I worship Shiva. But actually, it's the same as Vishnu. All gods are the same only, no. But really, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, so long as you work hard. <laughs> now, what does it mean? <laughs> and it's very comfortable. And I'm not giving some elite answer. I'm talking about something which happens on the street. I see regular people talking like that. It's just easy. I was uh, thinking about what you said about heroes. Mm -hmm. And I think there are heroes in Indian mythology, especially in the Mahabharat. And when you talk about how the gods in the Greek mythology impregnate people to create these heroes. Well, that's exactly what happens with the Pandavas. They're all created by God, including Karn. So how do you square that? You want to retort or understand? Understand. You explain it to me. Yes. Is being a hero a good thing? Well. Because the assumption is they have heroes, we too have heroes. The idea of the hero presupposes the idea of a villain and a victim. In the Natya Shastra, there are no heroes, there are no villains, there are no victims. There are just people struggling to take decisions. You may consider Ravan to be a villain, but Ravan doesn't see himself as a villain, he sees himself as a victim. You may think Surpanakha is a villain, I may think she's a hero. And therefore, there is fluidity between these three concepts. The storyteller has the power to decide who is the hero. There is no definitive hero. And therefore, hero is, we cannot translate the word Nayak as hero is very definitive. There's a very definite journey of a hero. He has to go through a particular journey. Has, the word hero comes from a context. It came from the Greek traditions. We are imposing that tradition on Indian thought. It's like trying, if I were to study Greek myths using Indian thought, I have to introduce rebirth. Heroes exist when there is only one life. Therefore, there's tragedy. I have one life and have failed. When you live infinite lives, stop crying. <laughs> no victims, no villains, no heroes. It's wiped out. When you talk of gods, are you referring to, now translate the word God for me in Hindi. 
is Bhagwan the same as Dev? Dev? There you have it. One English word, I have given you two. Where is Ishwar fit in? Prabhu. Prabhu means so many. Nath. I have to, and each word has a very specific meaning. There are the limited gods, which is Dev, and there is infinity, which is Bhagavan. Bhagavan never has to become finite in order to produce a child. He has to, infinite will never produce a child. And therefore, when Shiva produces a child, it is not, it is always in strange ways, right? He creates a child by beheading him. The impossible becomes probable, which is completely against Aristotle's view of aesthetics. So we have to understand context. It's not that they have it, so we also have it. Different. Alag. It's okay to be different. <laughs> Why should I? If you're comfortable, be happy with it. <laughs> See, there are no judges, but there are no judges in Hindu mythology. No. Okay. Simple answer. And buy one of my books, and I will sign it. <laughs> well, I, I have been given just a minute by the lady, so I'll quickly finish. I, I like what you said. But certain things I need to understand, which seem to violate anything I have read so far. And in fact, you alluded to that. What we say God is really because we don't have any other word. In Hindi, it's very clear what is Dev and Devta. And similarly, I didn't understand what you are trying to relate by saying um, outdated God or old God, you say. In Hindi, Asur is not outdated or old God. It's God and no God, not God. Somebody who's not a God, it's good or bad. So I thought in Hinduism, this always means God is goodness, a symbolism of goodness. So that is why a tree is a God, a monkey is a God, a cow is a God, wherever it is goodness. So is that what you're trying to communicate here? I think you misunderstood me. I said when the first translations were happening, when the people were translating these books for the first time, they, they used the Greek template to explain Indian stories. And they say the Devasur fight, the fight between Devas and Asuras, is like the Olympians and the Titans. It didn't work because the template is wrong. The Devas are the children of Brahma. The Asuras are also children of Brahma. So both are children of Brahma. And the entire narratives, the Puranas, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, all of them are about sibling rivalry. So who you consider your enemy is also your brother. Uh, uh, there is a mother who wants... Yeah. So, Ramayana is a property dispute. Who should be king? Ram or Bharat? No, you may not read it. I'm sorry, but I know... That's your truth, this is my truth. <laughs> See, yeah, so I said, your truth is also valid and my truth is also valid. So tension care. Okay, I think um, it might be time for the Indian... <laughs> yes. so, I come with my Indian head to officially close the session uh, yeah. and to say that our hero yes. <laughs> from the heavens to translate for us the epics uh, yes. has his books available outside. Absolutely. So yes. if you all want to engage more with him and understand more about his way of approaching things, you know, you are most welcome to and watch out for the main ads. <laughs> and really, that was absolutely fascinating. That comparison is something I've never even thought about.